So you know how to run a service and a deployment inside of Kubernetes, but how do you actually keep any of the data that you might create while you're running your applications? Today we figured that out. Our goal for today's tutorial is to learn how to run a service like Postgres inside of Kubernetes, and then to connect our meal plan Rails application to the database that is running in Kubernetes instead of the one that we have running on the Kubernetes host VM. The Rails application is an example of a stateless application because in between requests, no state is actually held inside the application. That gets, that gets dumped out. You'll notice that web apps still have state, but that's because it's actually stored in a database or external services like Redis in between requests. And that's how it, you make it seem like a web application is stateful. There are very few situations where the actual web application itself is stateful because that's kind of hard to do. Stateless applications are really easy for us to tear down and spin back up because we don't have to worry about any kind of state. Stateful applications are a little bit less so because if we tear them down, does that mean we blew away the data and we no longer have our database? Or does that mean that our data is stored somewhere else and we have to run an application to connect to it and actually handle the serving up of that data? If we look at what we have so far, you'll remember that we started a service called meal plan and we can get the URL for that by doing minikube service meal plan and then dash dash URL. This will give you the port number and the IP address that you need to be using. I already have it opened up over here and I've added a fake recipe to it just so we can show that when we connect to a separate database that it is indeed a different database that doesn't have my fish tacos recipe. For us to run the meal plan application, we needed a few Kubernetes pieces. We needed services, deployments, and config maps. We need all of those things in order to run Postgres also, but we also need a persistent volume to store the data in between our container or pod in this case, being torn down and started back up again. The approach we're gonna to take today is going to kind of be layering these things on top. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build it out as though it were a stateless application where the state would go away when we would destroy the pod. And then we will add in that persistence layer. One new thing that we're gonna to do today is we're gonna package up the service and the deployment into a single file. That way, when we go to create something using kubectl create, it will actually create both for us. So if we open up deployments, and then in here we say postgres.yaml, we'll create two things. So the first thing we need is going to have the API version of v1 kind of service. Metadata is going to have the name of Postgres. The default port for this is going to be 5432, and then we're going to give it a selector app name of Postgres. And then that's all we need for our service. To define multiple types of Kubernetes objects in the same file, you just need to separate them using three dashes. Everything we put under these three dashes is gonna be a new Kubernetes object. We're gonna create our deployment now. Since we did this in the previous tutorial and we detailed everything involved in creating a deployment, I'm just going to start and stop this and paste in what this value is so you don't have to see me type, but we'll cover it briefly afterwards. The deployment for this is pretty straightforward and it's actually very similar to the deployment we created for the meal plan in the previous tutorial. Uh, much of the same metadata as you'd expect from our service too, so a lot of these things match. And then we actually take two of the environment variables that we had in meal plan and we bring them right over because we need these to be exactly the same, so we'll pull them from the same config. The only other thing we're doing is we're specifying the container port of 5432 and naming that port as Postgres. Now we can save the file, close it, and then we can actually start creating this. Now if we run kubectl create-f deployments Postgres, it'll go off and create both our service and our deployment. We actually created these just for the sake of showing that we could get this up and running pretty quickly, but we're gonna delete these now so that we can recreate them in a second with it having the added step of being able to add its own persistence through a persistent volume claim. So we can kubectl delete f and then give it the same. Now we can reopen that file up and we'll add some more stuff down at the bottom here. So we'll put another three dashes and now we're gonna be adding a persistent volume claim. So this will have the API version of v1, the kind of persistent volume claim, metadata, for the name we're going to give this Postgres PV 
claim. And then in the spec, we'll just give it a few different things here. We have access modes. So this is read, write once. And what we're saying here is that for this persistent volume claim, there's only one pod that can access this for read write purposes at one time. All right, resources, give requests, storage. And in this case, uh, I'm gonna give it five gigabytes, but you can change this to be you know, a storage amount that makes sense for you. And what this does is it says that for this particular amount of persistent storage, we need five gigabytes. So put me on a server that has at least five gigabytes that it can give me. Remember that Kubernetes kind of, it, one of its purposes is that it lets you fully utilize the services that are at your disposal. That includes fully utilizing hard drive space. Now this will create our persistent volume claim, but we have to use it. And so we're gonna do that by coming up here and underneath the ports, we're gonna add a few different things. We're gonna add volume mounts. Give only need one right now. We'll call this Postgres storage. Give it the mount path. And this will be the directory inside of the container that it's going to mount the data on. So this is the exact same thing we would be doing if we were using a volume in Docker Compose. So this will go into var lib postgres ql db dash data. And then underneath here, we have to back this out a couple more. It, it's gonna be in line with containers and we'll say volumes. And we're gonna create one, it's gonna be Postgres storage. And then we wanna say that the persistent volume claim is gonna have the claim name of Postgres oops, PV claim. So this tells it that it's gonna need to use this persistent volume claim that specifies that it needs read write access and it needs at least five gigabytes of memory or hard drive space. And so that's what this volume is gonna set up. This persistent volume claim when we spin it up is gonna then be like, oh, there's not actually a persistent volume for me. So I will create one of those also. So in this one object, we're gonna actually create two and then for this to be of any use to our actual container, we have to mount it into our deployment or rather the deployments container. So now we can save this. And if we kubectl create dash F deployments Postgres again, you'll notice that it created a persistent volume claim. Let's take a look at the information about that claim. So if we do kubectl describe and then we can say PVC for persistent volume claim, Postgres PV claim. It'll give us quite a bit of information here. You'll see that it has the name we expect. It's uh, used in this particular volume. It has the capacity we wanted, the read write access. And then you also see down here, the some of the events that have happened that provisioning succeeded, successfully provisioned volume. And then it shows you right there. So now if we go and look at persistent volumes, if we just do kubectl get PV, you'll see that this is a persistent volume. So even though it says volume up here, that doesn't mean volume like we would mount inside of a container. It means a persistent volume in Kubernetes land. And that's what this is right here. So if we copy this and we kubectl describe this PV, we can get even more information shows you what type it is and where exactly it's at on the host that it's running on. If we look at kubectl get pods, you can see that we do have a Postgres container running and it's still running, so that's good. The next step for us is going to be to get our meal plan application to connect to it. And remember that we do that through environment variables, specifically the Postgres underscore host environment variable, and that's stored inside of a config map. So we need to change that value in the config map, deploy those config map changes to our meal plan deployment. And then we need to run the manual steps to set up the database inside of our Postgres container. And that's done through Rails and its helpers so that we can create the database and run our migrations. So starting off, we will kubectl edit config map. And then this was meal plan dash config. So instead of having this IP address, we're gonna have it go to Postgres. And this is the name of our service. So similar to the same way that we had 
containers running on Docker networks using Docker Compose that could reference one another by name. We can do that between services. So we will save this. Unfortunately, deploying config map changes is not the most well-defined thing in Kubernetes. And what you actually have to do is you have to tear down the container and start it back up. And you can do that via scaling. There's a better way to do that that we're going to cover when we talk about doing zero downtime deployments using Kubernetes. But for right now, I'm going to show you just by scaling it down and then scaling it back up. So we will kubectl, scale, and then we'll scale the deployment. That is meal plan. And then we want to set the replicas to zero. And then in the same command, we will, so you'll use a semicolon there. You will kubectl scale deployment meal plan. And then you'll set the replicas back up to one. So it scales it down, it scales it back up. So this will give us a new container. If we go back over to our browser and we just look at this, we should get some sort of error because there shouldn't be a database. Ah, that's good. So that means we're at least not talking to the old database that is running on the Minikube host. So let's kubectl get the pods so we can snag the name of our newest meal plan pod. And the reason we need to do this is because we're going to manually run a command inside of it. Similar to how we could do docker compose exec, you can do kubectl exec, give it the pod name. Uh, in this case, we want to say dash it. And then the dash dash just, just means that we're done passing arguments to it. And then this is the command we want to run. So we want to run env grep postgres host this will let us know if we set it properly so it did pick up our changes of postgres and then if we go back up and take a look at this again we're going to change this to do rake db setup there we go scrolling back up we can see that it created the meal plan production database and then it ran the migrations now if we go back to the browser and refresh again you can see that it actually did work and then we should be able to sign up. So if we give this some user information, and then now we should be able to create a recipe. And we're basically back to where we were, except that now our database is running inside of Kubernetes. So we went through that pretty quickly, but in this tutorial, you learned how to set up a volume using a persistent volume claim. And although it set up the volume for us behind the scenes, uh, it still did what we wanted it to do. And then you also connected two services together and learned how to run a stateful application inside of Kubernetes. So later on, we will tackle better ways of deploying changes for configuration so that you don't have to scale down to nothing and then scale back up so we can have zero downtime in our deploys. But for this tutorial, I think we covered enough ground. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and I really appreciate you sticking around to the end. I apologize for my voice sounding a little weird. I'm getting over a sickness. But if you like this tutorial, then share it with your friends and uh, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get all the videos that are released. 